Okay, thanks. Um, I'd like to introduce uh, Greer Dolby. She's a uh, affiliate uh, of our Center for Mechanisms of Evolution. Uh, and she'll give you a, a few minutes of uh, description of her research, just a little background. Uh, Greer uh, started out as a joint uh, earth science biology major at Boston University and then went on to get a PhD uh, at UCLA. She came here in, uh, I think in 2015, started out as a postdoc with uh, Kenro Kasumi uh, and is now a uh, assistant research professor in the School of Life Sciences. Uh, what's unique about Greer is uh, the breadth of her interest. Uh, she merges together ideas from uh, geography, earth science, climate, uh, and biology to understand uh, what it is that determines the distribution of species over landscapes and uh, also confronted with climatological change, which of course is quite uh, relevant these days. She's already landed a nice uh, National Science Foundation grant, which is quite an accomplishment for someone at her stage. So Greer, it's all yours. Welcome. Thanks, Mike. Um... Can you all see me, I think? There are the slides. Uh, yeah, so thanks, Mike, and thanks. Um, I'm really excited for the opportunity to tell you a little bit about what my group does today. Uh, next slide, please, Julie. All right, so let's start with um, a motivating question that uh, governs a lot of our work, which is basically, where does biodiversity come from? And we'll start with a definition of, of what biodiversity is, which I'll define as the number and the variation of species that live on our planet. And uh, biodiversity comes around in basically two main ways. The first is through the generation of new species, which you can see on that tree of life plot at the bottom where you have individual lineages that are branching then into two lineages, two lineages into four lineages, for example. And at the bottom, you can see the origin of life. And then all the tips represent species that are living today on our planet. So that's the generation of new species. The second thing that's important for biodiversity is actually the retention of those species, the idea that those species don't go extinct over time. So you can see several examples, again, in that, in that tree on this slide that shows a lineage that's been ex that goes extinct. And the one that's probably uh, most easily recognizable is the one, uh, the lineage of the dinosaurs going extinct over on the right on um, under the reptiles branch. Next slide. But what we as biologists kind of have a tendency to overlook is the fact that the landscape that these species live on and evolve on is itself dynamic and constantly changing. So to go over a couple examples of this here on the top left, we see a globe and this is what it looked like about 18,000 years ago. During the last ice age, you can see glaciers shown here in white and blue had dramatically expanded relative to present day, how they look today, which you can see on the right. What we see below that is the idea that um, when during those ice ages down on the left, you can see what that did to the configuration of land masses. So here we're looking at a map of the Indo-Pacific and you can see that land shown in black was this big, big, large landmass because sea level was so low because all of that water was stored in those glaciers on land. And that is in contrast to what it looks like today where when those sea levels rebounded, when those glaciers flooded, what we see is what we see today, right? Where you have all these individual islands um, that are separated. Next slide, please. And over longer time scales, there are other processes happening. So you might be familiar with plate tectonics, which moves land masses around on Earth's surface. And importantly, when those land masses collide, they form what we know as mountain ranges. So what you can see um, that black star, it about 65 million years ago on the left graph, you can see that black star on that on what will become India. And on the right, you see where India is today. So India was moving northward and slammed into Asia and formed what we know today as the Himalaya. Next slide, please. What's important about this is that these changes in our surface can actually lead to the formation of new species over time. And so uh, here we'll go over two kind of quick toy examples. On the left, 
at time zero, we have this flat landmass, and at time one, we have growth of some topography or mountain range or something like that. And what that can do is that growth of topography can actually isolate populations. And if those populations are no longer able to reproduce with one another, then they can drift apart and become different species over time, which is depicted here by the pink and orange populations of beetles. On the right, what we see is uh, a climatological example of that, where uh, time zero, we see kind of even distribution of precipitation across land. And then at time one, what we see is that has changed. So you have more precipitation here in the left part of that, less precipitation in that right part of the landmass. And in this case, those two populations have adapted to those climatological differences and have uh, adapted differently and become different species through uh, differential adaptation. Next slide, please. What's important to recognize about this is that both of these processes can lead to divergence or the formation of new lineages. But what's different is the, the earth process that's responsible for shaping that divergence. Next slide. And so what my group does is basically study, try to understand that relationship or set of relationships better. And to do this, we uh, study the DNA, so the genomes of organisms and individuals living on the landscape today. And we study all different species, but in this example, um, I'm just showing lizards. And we pair that with geological data to understand how the landscape has changed in that region over time. And then we use statistical models um, to try to quantitatively link those two data sets to try to determine specifically what parts of the landscape change over tens of thousands or millions of years was it that led to specific evolutionary patterns that we see in the genetic data. Next slide, please. So I'll go over uh, two quick examples of this from our work. The one on the top goes back to that ice age scenario I mentioned earlier where what we discovered was that when sea level was low during ice ages, it was constricted to this very narrow part of the continental shelf or of the coastline. And that narrow steep part, what happened was it wound up isolating a lot of populations into these kind of patches. And that isolation of populations as we went over in the example actually led to um, genetically distinct lineages and led to uh, subspecies level divergence in, in some species of fishes that we studied. The reason this might be important is because we know that sea level change wasn't a regional phenomenon, it was global. And so when you expand the impact of that process on a global scale, then you can imagine, especially over deeper time scales, how that can maybe lead to a lot of uh, new biodiversity. And then on the bottom, a more regional example, uh, we've been studying desert tortoises, two species of desert tortoises here locally, where one is primarily found in California, one is primarily found in Arizona. And what we discovered by studying these populations or these two lineages is that they probably evolved to, they probably diverged partly due to the formation of the Colorado River, which happened about 5 million years ago and it restricted gene flow between the populations. But what we also discovered was that these two populations or these two species also seem to have adapted to this really strong um, precipitation gradient. So as you're probably familiar, monsoon precipitation comes up and rains locally in our Sonoran Desert, but it doesn't generally bring storms into California. And so we have the strong precipitation gradient. What we found were divergence in genes relating to perception of uh, thirst and water regulation and vegetation differences. Next slide. So as we keep studying different species in different habitats and in different geographical settings, we're trying to build this understanding for how different landscape processes shape the formation of new species. Which processes are more are most important and are some types of organisms more likely to be affected than others? and why. And I will leave it there and take some questions if there's time or um, we can keep on. And my contact info is on that slide as well.